tweet or not to tweet? Um, I have a confession to make. It's a, a question I ask myself about six to ten times a day. Um, because yes, I'm an addict to Twitter. Anybody else who shares this emotion? Who has to tweet or not to tweet on their mind? Can I see hands? A few hesitation there. Okay, maybe not five to ten times a day. Who um, in the audience is actually on Twitter, is active on Twitter? Uh, is it the age group? Is it because the men have more important things to do? Anybody on Facebook? Okay. Are you friends with your daughters and sons on Facebook? Yeah. I think that should be forbidden. Because um, that's like being on the schoolyard with them. Uh, Google Plus, just to please Mohammed. One down here, two down there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, to tweet or not to tweet? The Arab Spring and the impact of social media. I'm uh, going to uh, destroy some of your uh, assumptions, ideas of social media and the Arab Spring, and maybe I'll give you some ideas on the benefits and some of the other aspects of tweeting, Facebooking, and uh, blogging. Connecting... Uh, Connecting my speech to the uh, wonderful quote of Mr. Sen, the role of women. Ladies and gentlemen, these are two of my heroines. For the Dutch people, I'm sure that the lady on the left is well known. She was my heroine when I grew up, when I was a teenager. I saw a movie called The Girl with the Red Hair about the life of Hanni Schaft, a resistance fighter who in the Second World War was instrumental of fighting for freedom during the occupation of the Germans. She, at her time, had no tools to her availability, such as Twitter or Facebook or blogging, but she still managed to communicate. On the right side, we see another heroine of mine, Razan Zaytouneh. She's from Syria, and at the moment, she is in hiding in Damascus. If Assad, President Bashar al-Assad, or his secret service or the Shabiha, the thugs, would know where she is, she would be killed, for sure. Because she is one of the future leaders. Unfortunately, Hani Schaft was, was executed during the Second World War. She, 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 she couldn't live to take on a role as a female leader of post-World War Netherlands. I really pray every day that Razan Zaytouni will be able to do that. Because Razan is a human rights activist. I met her in 2000 in Damascus. And she was active at that time as a lawyer, uh, as a human rights lawyer. And now she's active as the local coordinator of the resistance in Damascus. Every single day, she coordinates demonstrations, uh, taking care of the wounded, making sure that the communication about the demonstrations takes place on the internet via Twitter, via Facebook. And it's very dangerous. We'll come to that. Because not only we are watching, but the other side is watching as well. What I like about the activism of Razan Zaytouna is that it is a combination of online activism, she, makes, she shows the world what she's doing, but it's also a combination of offline activism. She actually goes into the streets in a warlike situation and takes care of people. This, ladies and gentlemen, is one of my heroes as well. Well, he is one of the social media stars in Egypt. His name is Mahmoud Salem, but people know him as Sand Monkey. And in his byline, which is like the little title on the Twitter account, he says he was not born with enough middle fingers. Shows you a little bit about what kind of character this person has. Uh, this summer, he has a blog called The Rantings of a Sand Monkey. This summer, he wrote a very interesting blog called The End of a Chapter. Maybe you thought I would start with a description on how the revolution in Egypt came about. But I think it's good to pause and see with the knowledge we have now, what happened in the past 18 months. And Mohammed Salem, in his blog, The End of a Chapter, he criticizes the revolutionaries for not having gone out into the streets and actually connect to the people in the street. He says, one thing the Muslim Brotherhood have been so good at was actually taking care of the people in the villages, in the poor neighborhoods. And maybe they didn't tweet about it, but they actually cared. And we, revolutionaries, using internet, we have only cared about being witty 
on the internet, but we should stop being witty and actually get things done. So he calls this clicktivism. You know, for the people who are on Facebook, it's so easy to say like or to retweet in my own addiction. Uh, but he says, no, go out and go into the streets. Now, I want to take you to a very special moment in the revolution. And I'm sure that Mohammed is pleased that I put up this Facebook page because one of the employees, and we didn't coordinate this, and I have no shares in Google, um, the, one of the most important events was this page. We are all Khaled Said, and for those of you who know about Facebook, you see there are two, 243K, that means 243,000 likes. If I had shown you the Arabic page, there would have been more than two million likes. Khaled Said was a young boy, 20 years, 27, in Alexandria, who was arrested in an internet cafe while he was uploading a YouTube film of police violence. I think somebody was molested or even sodomized. While he was uploading this film, he was arrested. They took him into the jail or in one of those security services. They tortured him to death. In the summer, I met his mother, Laila Marzouk, but everybody knows her as Umm Khaled Said. And she is still waiting for her death certificate. She has asked the new president of Egypt, please give me the death, death certificate of my son. And I was uh, in a cafe with a friend of mine who's also called Khaled, and he told her, Um Khaled, we are all your children. The children of Egypt are your children. And in a way, it's true, because Khaled Said has become the symbol of the revolution of the new uh, Egypt. Um, now, about the page. Um, Wa'il Ghunayim, a name you might not know, but rings now as a revolutionary name to many people of the Arab world, was the, um, well, the page uh, manager of this page. And actually, this page was a way to mobilize people on the 25th of January when the uh, Arab or the Egyptian revolution started. And it's still a very active Facebook page. So this was a very clear example of how Facebook can be used to mobilize people to get actually out into the streets and in a way become a real threat to the Egyptian government. The Western media has painted a picture of um, the Arab Spring as a spring initiated by young, intellectual, vibrant, hip and happening people. And I remember that people would ask me, Petra, they all speak English. Well, actually, yes, the elite and the well-educated people do. But most of the tweets are in Arabic, so they weren't read by many people in the West. Um, but here you see the top 100 Arab influentials. Actually, we were talking in our, at our table of, uh, about Naguib Sawiris. He is the man in the middle. He's an Egyptian uh, uh, businessman. He has about 500,000 followers on uh, Twitter. But there are also uh, Islamic uh, scholars. There is Sheikha Lubna in the left angle. She is the uh, Minister of Foreign Trade of the United Arab Emirates. Business people, religious people, but not all revolutionaries. I'm sorry that you can't see the small picture, but I want to make a point about who has most followers. This is one of the most, I'm sure uh, Mohammed knows Amr Khalid. Um, Amr Khalid is, well, I don't want to insult him, but he is a bit like Billy Graham, uh, an evangelical preacher. He used to be an engineer, but somehow he managed to make Islam into a moral compass for young people in Egypt and the rest of the Arab world, not in a fundamentalist way, but really in a, in a, in a way that's so appealing that he became like a pop star. He has more than 800,000 followers. Mahmoud Salem, the one who doesn't have enough middle fingers, he's also popular, but he only has 90,000 followers. I have 9,000, so I'm still working on it. Maybe next revolution. Before I go into um, who this man is, just a reality check about uh, the relation between traditional media and social media. Yes, without social media, there would not have been the revolution as it was. But without traditional media, TV, radio, people would not have known about what was happening. People who don't have internet. For example, in Egypt, 85, 90 million people, about 
20 million people have internet or internet access. Of those 20 million, only 3 to 5 percent have Twitter or Facebook. So imagine, but if you go to Egypt, anybody who has been to Egypt, Egyptians excluded? <laughs> yeah. Well, you might have noticed that every single household, almost every single household has a TV set. And almost every single Egyptian has access to satellite television, either in their own home, at the cafe, or at the neighbors. And the satellite television, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, were instrumental as well to uh, get uh, an impression of the general people of what was happening at Tahrir Square. Now, this man is um, Evgeny Mozarov. He is from Belarus, and he has written an extremely critical book about the benefits of internet. He shows in this book the net delusion that there is really a shadow side to the internet. He says, as much as internet can be used by activists to uh, rebel, to use freedom of expression, to say what they're against or in favor of, as much the, gov well, the governments of oppressive states, dictatorships can use the internet against people. So we have to be aware. Um, this is the, uh, of course, we all learned about the pyramid of Maslow. This is a new pyramid. This is the pyramid uh, of Morozov. And, well, I'll tell you, in the Arab world, they use internet for basically the same things we like to use internet. Not only pornography, but games, uh, chatting with friends, and very few people, as you see, have the urge to use the internet to download Amnesty International reports or Human Rights Watch reports. So we have to be realistic. The internet in itself is not a revolutionary tool. It's the way people use internet, uh, what they can do with it. And one of the ways it's being used, and this is where Morozov warns us, is um, by guys like these guys, the Syrian Electronic Army. Bashar al-Assad, when he became president of Syria, I was in Syria, this was in 2000, and I remember being uh, at the heads of missions meeting of the European Union diplomats or ambassadors, and they were all so excited, because Bashar al-Assad, he had studied in London, and he was the head of the computer society, so he must be modern. Well, we said Western, but they meant modern. Yes, he's very modern. He knows how to use the internet to oppress people. And the Syrian Electronic Army is actually a group of Bashar al-Assad uh, supporters who went on Facebook, who went on Twitter, intimidated people, brought people's lives into danger. And I could see it on my own Facebook with my Syrian friends that they were very concerned to be outspoken. So I agree, freedom of expression, yes. But with the Syrian Electronic Army, on, uh, on, a, on a killing mission, even virtually, my friends in the beginning were posting poems on Facebook to show what they thought. So I'm like, why are all these poems of Mahmoud Darwish on my Facebook, uh, and a Palestinian poet? Because they could not be outspoken on Facebook because they knew they were being followed by the Syrian electronic army. I attended an Internet Freedom, uh, Freedom Online conference uh, end of 2011, and here we see Hillary Clinton and Uri Rosenthal. I think for, uh, this, for those who don't know, Uri Rosenthal uh, is the uh, acting minister of foreign affairs, and I think this was one of his big moments of glory. He had Carl Bild and Hillary Clinton, Eric Schmidt of Google was also in town in The Hague, and he was so happy to be activist on Internet freedom. You know, this is. In, in politics, you have these tastes of the day. When I was a diplomat, it was gender. Now, in the Dutch government, it's a little bit gay rights, but definitely internet freedom. For Hillary Clinton, of course, uh, the Secretary of State, it's very similar. It's this idea that states can be instrumental in promoting internet freedom. And I think there is a catch. Because on the one hand, at this conference, they announced funds for activists to uh, obtain technology, to get training, and for those of you who do, do not know, for example, when I was in Syria the last time in 2010, my uh, computer was completely messed up because every single internet cafe, I first had to install a different proxy address so people would not be able to go into my computer, and I really had to, to be cleaned up. Now, these, these surveillance technologies are 
factor, manufactured in the West as well. So here we have two people, two representatives of two states, the Netherlands and the United States, promoting internet freedom. At the same time, there are many American and even Dutch and European companies exporting spyware to control these activists who got funds from the same governments. So there is really a dilemma. Um, and I think it can be dealt with by laws. We need different kind of laws than we have. It's, I think I agree with you. There is a whole change going on because yes, of course, I want my daughter to be protected from child pornography or any other kind of pornography when she is on Google. So yes, I want a parent lock on, but, what is, but where is the margin from going into protecting people, young children, teenagers, into controlling people? And I think this is a discussion which really will take uh, more than we have at the moment. And at the same time, online activism needs new regulations and new uh, laws, but offline activism, with the present uh, atmosphere in Europe, I'm very concerned as well. One of my closest friends, Muaz al Khatib, Sheikh Muaz al Khatib, I don't know whether the Egyptian or the Assyrian or Gemini people know him, but watch this man, I would say he's almost like a Martin Luther King of the Arab world. He, is, um, he used to be the Khatib of the Umayyad Mosque, the preacher at the Umayyad Mosque. An amazing man. He's very much into tolerance and coexistence between religions. And he had to flee Damascus after he had been in prison for three times, tortured, martyred. Uh, tortured and, 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 well, he saw horrible things. Now he fled to Cairo, and what he needs is not online fame or being glorified by Uri Rosenthal. What he needs is a few months of refuge. He doesn't want to ask for asylum because that would be an insult to his country. He wants to go back when the war is over. Well, I will spare you the details, but for people like him to actually get access to Europe it's an ordeal. It's so humiliating and it really uh, embarrasses me. Um, well, protecting online and offline activists. That's indeed, what do we do when they run into trouble? States have a responsibility, but I think companies have a responsibility as well. And even we as citizens have a responsibility. And journalists have a responsibility. What upsets me now in the reporting on uh, in Syria is how, how foreign journalists go in and use local journalists to tape, indeed, with those, with those cameras. But they don't get helmets, they don't get insurance payment, they don't get any compensation. Then the foreign journalist goes, takes those wonderful giga, I don't know, dozens of, of, of trucks with information and use it. And I think we also have to see how we can um, reward, I mean, not in, uh, in money ways, but in different ways, how we can reward those online activists for their work offline and offline, online. Well, ladies and gentlemen, to tweet or not to tweet, at times it's great fun. I enjoy it at least 10 times a day. Um, and sometimes it can be really dangerous. But if you want to follow me on Twitter, because I want to go beyond those 10,000. <laughs> this is my Twitter account, and I thank you very much for your attention.